Okay, every movement has to start somewhere, right? Well, George, in Craig and Mark Kielberger's case, it started in Pakistan, 1995. Craig was 12. He was flipping through the paper at home in Ontario, looking for the comics. But something else caught his eye. A story about Iqbal Masih. When Iqbal was four, he was sold into child slavery. When he was 10, he escaped and started speaking out against child labor. At 12, Iqbal was gunned down, presumably because of his activism. Craig was inspired by Iqbal's courage and horrified by what happened to him. So what did he do? Craig gathered 11 friends from his grade seven class and started Free the Children. Fun to cuddle, fun to cuddle. The goal was to fight child exploitation and poverty and to prove kids can change the world. You have the power in your words, in your actions, and in your policy making to give these children a hope for a better future. The group captured the world's attention early on after Craig traveled to India and publicly pressured Prime Minister Jean Chrétien to meet with him. I got out most of my points. He says, well, it's a very complex issue, and we do quite a bit, and we do this, and that, we do that, which Canada does, and I'm very happy that it does that. But there's still much more that Canada has to do. Craig's older brother, Mark, joined in along the way, and together, they've created a worldwide network of kids helping kids. Free the Children says it engages more than 350,000 young people a year and has made life better for hundreds of thousands of kids through education and development programs. So here's their book right here. The World Needs Your Kid. Brand new music from the Kielbergers. It's more like a book. Craig and Mark are here. Nice to see you, boys. You know, I think for a lot of people, uh, and it's nice to have you back, I think for a lot of people when they think about the, you know, the, the, the days that you do, the, the me to we days and all that, they, they do think about it in the context of you and kids, uh, but this is more directed to parents. Was that something that dawned on you you needed to do? Was it always part of the plan? Quite simply, we bring together these young people and these massive audiences, we get them inspired, we get them ways to get involved, but more than reaching them, the most powerful people in the world, they're not politicians. I don't believe that. Laws get changed, overturned, not CEOs. We saw it with the financial crisis. It's parents, because mm -hmm. it's how they raise kids. You touch a child's life, you touch the future, including how they're going to vote, become socially active, volunteer, live lives beyond themselves. And so we wanted to go straight to the source. Help a parent raise a child who looks at this world to care and contribute. And when did it occur to you that that was the reality, that that's, what, that that's the approach you needed to take? Well, after our speeches, we were often asked by parents, like, well, what do you do? Or what did your parents do? Or what can I do as a parent to create that change or mm -hmm. to instill those values or, or to make my kid be very passionate and energetic. And of course, there's no magic formula. There's no one thing. There's no, no one activity that a parent can do. But there are multiple things. And we spent four years. We yeah. spent literally countless hours, 500 interviews later, and found out what are the things that you need to do to create socially responsible children. Now, who did you interview? Because you guys aren't parents, so I imagine you don't have, you have about as much experience as I do <laughs> yeah. in, in raising kids. We did have a third co-author with us, Shelley okay. Page, who is a parent with kids, right. and we interviewed more than 200 individuals from child development psychologists and experts to contributing authors. Archbishop Desmond Tutu wrote for the book, Jane Fonda, Wait, Mia does he Farrell. Have kids? Yeah, yeah. in fact, amazing. he starts every morning by taking the newspaper, putting it flat on the kitchen table, and he calls it God's to-do list, delivered right to his front door nice. every morning. And then we also interviewed mom and dad. We said, hey, mom and dad, like, what did you guys do? And yeah. you know, all these things that we had no idea they were doing, they were, and it had a massive impact on our lives. The, uh, we, we are in the generation now where people are paying attention. Mm. Uh, there is a motivated, I mean, the, the thousand, I was just in Vancouver for the comedy festival, and you guys were setting up there earlier for later in the week. There were a lot of people. Uh, that were showing up to be a part of your event. When did you get a sense that this was happening, like you were actually reaching people? Well, last week we had 16,000 students in Vancouver from audiences. Uh, you draw more than Molly Crew does now. How does that feel? <laughs> well, we also had the Dalai Lama as part right. of the lineup, which so, helps get the message out. Well, or... he draws more girls backstage than Molly Crew does. <laughs> so it's, it's very it's crazy. different. Yeah. Actually, the crazy one was this week we also had the Jonas Brothers on stage. Yeah. And so it's, it's... Don't, I don't listen. I don't know what they look like. Of course I don't not. want to know what they look like. But okay, go. Say, just tell them. No, no. Tell them. But yeah. it's, it's, you got the rock concert feel, but yeah. more than a rock concert because it's the year-long actions. In fact, we launched a campaign called 10 by 10 with you students, a million hours of volunteer service by Canadian kids helping their peers, mm -hmm. and enough funds they're going to raise to adopt 10 villages around the world. It's 100,000 lives with clean water, health, and sanitation. So we're challenging people, giveyour10.com, mm -hmm. to log on and get more information. And we also launched a campaign to get a million hours of community service. So yeah. as much as important to focus internationally, it's also important to focus Absolutely. domestically as well. You know, the thing that I find interesting about what you guys do, you travel an awful lot, and you're in a position now where because you can, I mean, you just got married, right? Um, you're not married yet, but you need to, if you will, or not. You don't have kids, but much of this is is the kind of time commitment 
that you put into it that makes it impossible to be around your family. And you see it with a lot of people around the world, like you know, who are who are famous spokespeople, philanthropists, people who work in social work. Th they preach about the, how important it is to be together and family and balance, and they don't have any because they're so far away. How do you find your way through that? The fact that you're never home. What helps is his wife works for us in Kenya in the yeah. development project. So when he's traveling overseas, it's yeah. it's visiting. She's incredibly patient. We actually got yeah. married recently in Kenya as well. Right. And so she spends half of her time. Her name's Roxanne. Spends half her time in Kenya. Half Do her time here. Do you sing to her? Do you sing the song? Oh, I, not didn't really the Psy songs, but yeah. I, you know, it's, it's all it's all relative, I guess. But nevertheless, it was just absolutely incredible. And so we have this incredible group of people who who live and breathe this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you go into our office. It's you know the average age is kind of 23, 24. We kind of think it's like Google without the pay. Right. So we have people work really, really hard. Super Six, unappealing. Yeah. That's Six, not a pitch. 16 hours a day. Yeah. But instead of stock options, you get to change the world. Right. You, you yeah. actually do get stock options, just in a better world. It's right. Oh, is yeah. that what it is? Yeah. yeah. And how long before they realize that that's not exactly a <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's a couple years, but it's all good. I, you know, but if you think about it, I mean, was that, almost 50 years with Kennedy's Peace Corps, like it, when, when, when you saw a, a motivated uh, youth, if, if you will, and his change, and then, and then things kind of went kind of hairy for a bit, and then Obama, when he came back, and people yeah. talked a lot about hope. Absolutely. But man, it hasn't even been a year, and people are already kind of off the Obama train in terms of hope because they realize that you have a lot of belief, and then wait a minute, to actually have things executed, very challenging. How do you manage that when people, because ultimately people realize, and you said it yourselves, politicians, eh, rarely, and when in positions of power, rarely do they pull it off. These are the kinds of things you're talking about, poverty, helping people around the world, education, things like that. How do you manage the reality, which is hope is great, but execution isn't always there? You know, we have had the honor to open uh, and speak with a lot of politicians, including uh, Bill Clinton, once asked him who he thought the most powerful people in the world are, and he said the electorate, because as a political leader, he could only go so far as the people would let him go. It's why, you know, a lot of people question why we'd write a parenting book. Why not do another book that we've done in the past more towards change makers or textbooks yeah. or books aimed to, you know, public policy debates. I don't think we need a public policy debate on a lot of questions. We know how to end global climate change. We know how to address a lot of the challenges in the world. In fact, the reason that actually inspired to really the, the question you asked us to start with, what inspired the book, it was a conversation we had with the Dalai Lama when he said the greatest challenge in our world isn't global climate change. It's not weapons of mass destruction. It's not what we see in the newspaper. It's the fact that we're raising a generation of passive bystanders, a generation of kids who so often close their eyes. So how do we find hope? Is you, We need to have faith in our society to challenge young people to open their eyes and to well, open their see, hearts. Yeah, I suppose we are raising that generation, but I, I don't necessarily think it's their fault. And I know what Bill Clinton said to you, and, and when politicians sit across and tell me that, I don't, to, to, with respect to them, I don't believe them, because th they're actually in positions to do this kind of thing. And the electorate quite often asks them to do things, and they don't. Mm -hmm. So have you guys, in a sense, bypassed the officials now to you take them out of the equation? The people. Like when you pack out, we had 34,000 students this past two weeks fill That's a stadium incredible, man. Um, about social change. You had speakers from Elie Wiesel to the Dalai Lama from Robert Kennedy Jr. to social change activists who are young people. Mm -hmm. And those young people go from, they came from 2,000 Canadian schools. And they're going back to their schools as ambassadors for this message. We had 3,000 schools watching the live web broadcast. It's insane if you think of this generation of kids growing up in Canada who are aware, who are informed, and yes, making their voices heard. And this is the generation that's really going to get it done because like, they are more informed, more engaged. They understand these issues. They understand how to create the change. They go back to their schools. There's actual support structures in place. This is a generation that literally we've been waiting for. Are there things that have just blown your mind, things that you've seen that you can't believe you're, you're, you're seeing action on? I mean, every single day. I mean, this is small things, and it's not like one pivotal event per se. And every day we wake up and get an email from another kid who's been inspired who's creating that change or building that school or doing something really cool. Every day. And standing in that hall, though, this week with, you know, 34,000 students these past two weeks, just standing in there, any adult who doubts young people mm -hmm. or any politician who thinks that times aren't changing with youth being more aware and more informed, watch out. And they weren't just screaming for the Jonas Brothers or Headley yeah. or Jason Mraz. They were yeah. screaming for Robert Kennedy Jr. They were screaming yeah. for Ellie Wiesel's inspirational message of hope. That's people what they were, were screaming for. screaming for Jason Mraz? They were. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was screaming for Jason Mraz, actually, after no, I know, that's okay. I'm just kidding, yeah. <laughs> you guys obviously come across a lot of really interesting paths uh, you know, in, in your life. You, you've walked with amazing people. You've talked to amazing people. You've probably talked to people who haven't been famous in any way, shape, or form who've changed your lives. Uh, what we're going to do is run down a whole bunch of people that they've met and talked to, the Clintons, the Mandelas. We'll get some more stories, some behind-the-scenes stuff. Craig and Mark, the Kielbergers, when we come back. <laughs> Very nice.
Very nice. Um, Hi, I'm David Cross. Or am I? <laughs> I am. Or am I? <laughs>